So uh, Dr. Uh, Sutherland do a wonderful job by highlighting uh, his work in designing the surgical robot. And I used this photo and when I was doing my, uh, after uh, the, my first job in the uh, United States and the first machine uh, shipping to the big hospital was actually Da Vinci. And, and I get involved with a lot of training program over there to get the surgeon to uh, work under uh, such a, a sophisticated machine and allow a surgeon to do the task. This is a typical Da Vinci here. You can see one single surgeon was actually able to control up to four uh, robot arm to do the surgery. And if we focusing on the uh, robot arm, and uh, you can see this amazing skill the surgeon can build to here. And you see under the microscope uh, attached to the defense robot, and um, surgeon can actually do such a tiny fine motor movement. And this is like um, 10, uh, 10 zero suturing line and people can actually do this such tiny uh, uh, stitches in uh, the grip, right? And peeling uh, back to the original position in a very beautiful way, okay? So this is amazing. The surgical robot can uh, support the surgeon to do a better work. But if, you, if we move our attention to the surgeon side, if we move our attention to the surgeon side, and uh, you can actually see the surgeon have to uh, put in his finger into such a unique design to allow precision in his fingertip to translate into the robot end. Okay, and then this is this is kind of a unique interface. Uh, a surgeon need to practice under such a situation for a long time uh, before they can get used to. Uh, the machine system, such a, a complex machine system. When we're talking about the hand tool interface, uh, we need to understand within our hand, there are thousands, thousands of receptor uh, below our skin. And in the tip of our finger, we have uh, receptors, and this is we call subcutaneous receptors. They allow us to detect mechanical force, allow us to detect temperature change, allow us to detect any uh, damage to our skin, allow us to translate all this information to our hand. And all these uh, subcutaneous receptors, we call, often call the touch sensors, and then uh, merge to uh, the other group of the sen sensors. Okay, come on in other group of sensors that build inside our muscle and tenders. Within our muscle, we have a uh, muscle dough. And this muscle spindle, it's very um, dedicated, regulate the force generation from our muscle. And he worked with uh, another organ uh, within our joint, it's called Golgi tender organ. Together, we can sense the position of our hands. They can sense the movement of our hands. They can regulate very well to uh, the force delivered from our hand to the tissues. But when we're adding a tool, when we're adding a robotic tool, when we're adding a surgical tool, how can surgeon to precisely control the force generation to a uh, tool that without any sensory connection to our body. And this is a kind of a, to a research topic I am very interested in. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, the topic, uh, I hear Dr. Sutherland use the haptic feedback uh, several times. Uh, right, and the haptic feedback normally including the touch sensors within our skin, but also including uh, kinesthetic feedback that was actually taken from our, um, our muscle and the gorge tender. And touch sensors, it's very important to regulate our hand movement, regulate our force generation. And kinesthetic feedback is also very important as well. And my research, 
under uh, this uh, support from uh, this project was focusing on how well we can use kinesthetic feedback. Those information generated from the muscle from the tender are able to uh, allow us to control the force uh, of the surgeon and deliver the force in a precision way and then uh, control the tool for doing the surgery. Okay, one way uh, to block out the touch sensation, it is by touch sensors, those cutaneous, uh, uh, subcutaneous receptor under our skin, it's very dedicated to the change of physical property in our fingertips. If you're wearing the glove, uh, then uh, at a short period of time, the surgeon lose the sensation, lose those sensation, but they can practice, get used to, we call this adapt, adaptation process. They can still regain the control of the hand. But when you combine a uh, glove wearing and then the tool used, uh, it become quite difficult uh, for surgeon to regain the control of the surgical a surgical tool attached to the hand. And uh, in one of this study, we asked people to do uh, wearing double glove, compare a double glove with our negative hand, and then to do the laparoscopic surgery, which was actually uh, performed through a long uh, shaft instrument, and then to do a precision, a precise the cutting task, wearing double glove for young, for, for surgeon under training, they can significantly reduce uh, force produ production in such a difficult environment. So longer training hour is required for those surgeons to get used to such a situation. And such a training as we are uh, in our recent writing paper uh, uh, can be done in the simulation environment, allow surgeon to get used to wearing the glove reduce the touch sensation, and plus uh, when they control a tool with a very complex physical property. Okay, and then we're talking about another situation when you have a three-dimensional model, when you have a virtual model that created by the computer and, and maybe that 3D anatomy model can generate from, uh, from medical image and display to the monitor how can we train our surgeon to, to do virtual dissection, virtual surgery, uh, interacting with the computer when we display this digital uh, the patient model and the haptic devices, we call this a fountain, uh, this fountain uh, haptic devices is the one tool allow us to, sorry, uh, we need to show this video, okay? Allow us to uh, getting, uh, the touch sensors, uh, getting the touch sensors with virtual tissues. And this is another way, if we want to create a virtual training model, uh, displaying the computer, and we still, if we still want the surgeon to practice with the virtual surgery, uh, with this, this three dimensional um, tissue and anatomy, and then we need some kind of devices allow surgeon to interacting with the virtual object. And this is another uh, kind of research area uh, that was carried out in our research lab. Okay, the next one is talking about uh, kinesthetic feedback. Okay, kinesthetic feedback is something that generates from one people's muscle and gauge tender, and it regulates our force delivery in the surgery setting. And our research question is, can we transfer uh, one person's kinesthetic feedback, kinesthetic feedback loop into another person's hands. It's pretty much like we're talking about hand-to-hand -hand tr training. Can we say uh, duplicate, recall and duplicate movement from one surgeon and deliver to the second surgeon? And in this very uh, 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 basic model, we create a devices like this one, okay, devices like this one, um, allow one people, one people here uh, in a black jacket here to move his hand, to move his hand, to create a pattern, to create a pattern, movement pattern. And the second person uh, um, cover his eye. And then he can, we allow this um, 
movement from this first person to translate to the second person. We want to uh, uh, find answer to this question. Can people purely receive haptic feedback from other person can translate it into his model uh, movement coordination. So, um, so one people here created five different pattern. Uh, can the receiver purely through kinesthetic feedback loop understand the movement from uh, the other person and build this movement into his memory? If those information cannot build into his memory, we cannot expect the task can be transferred from one person to the second person. And the skill set cannot build if those movement cannot move, can, if those information cannot save into his memory base. So when we create all this uh, setting and then test it in the lab, and we understand when the pattern, movement pattern become more uh, difficult from four steps, six steps, eight steps, 10 steps to 12 steps, people can remember those haptic feedback uh, up to eight and 10 steps. After more than 10 steps, his memory dropping down significantly. So, but it looks like people can receive haptic feedback and build into his memory similar well as they taking those information for his video channel. So we prove uh, kinesthetic feedback can be transferred and can be moved into a receiver's memory base. And this is the uh, foundation for building a movement skill. And this is a paper we published. Uh, uh, gaining build information through haptic feedback. It is a very good way uh, to teach the skill. Uh, even without the help from the vision. Okay, so uh, this is a kind of a, a, a summary that we can do. So um, with this very basic uh, physical model, uh, we prove a very important theoretical foundation for skill learning uh, through transfer kinesthetic feedback. We move one step further to build a robotic system in. Yes, okay. So we actually connect, we actually connect four unit of Fenton, four unit of haptic devices. Uh, so two Fenton devices in one end, uh, which was um, controlled uh, by the operator and his movement, his both hands movement uh, through the control of the surgical, uh, surgical tool can be recorded, can be captured and translate to the second person. And the second person can receive all tiny little movement coming from surgeon's hand. And he can passively feel the movement from the primary surgeon. I'd like to show uh, this video to you. Okay. You see on this active end, and uh, this is probably a passive end. And uh, so uh, the passive end, all the movement are controlled by the uh, master in one end and all surgeons hand motion can deliver to the training um, console here. Uh, we, we use this uh, simple task to uh, share the screen from surgeon's vision site and allow the learner to understand exactly what task is currently performed. The learner here uh, is kind of passively receive all the subtle movement from the surgeon. Uh, let me see that, show this video again. So this learner end, uh, the tool was passively moved.
the learner had chance to feel the movement uh, from the other end. Okay, uh, if you are a surgical resident, if you are, you, you are, you are a surgeon and in training, do you believe uh, receive this haptic feedback, uh, this kinesthetic feedback from the experienced surgeon can help you to learn the task in a fast fashion? Uh, this is a research question we're trying to, uh, we're trying to prove. Okay, and then um, in the control laboratory environment, we ask a, a group of residents to come to our simulation training lab. And one group of surgeon, uh, they, they practice the, uh, this pattern cutting task that you see this pattern cutting, uh, they control, the, control these two uh, uh, lap uh, laparoscope uh, grasper and the scissors, and then cut this pattern off, cut this pattern off. And um, they can practice um, probably uh, 20 times, 20 times, right. And all these 20 times are blocked into um, uh, four sections. They practice five times and taking a rest and practice another five times and taking a rest and practice another time to, uh, five times taking a rest. So this kind of training section uh, are uh, overlapping four uh, training days. And this is a control group. They just practice by themselves. We call it the self-learning group. Uh, the other, group, uh, they practice five times, and then they receive the feedback. They see other people's performance. On the top of watching uh, experienced surgeons' performance, they also put in a hand in such a devices to feel how well the surgeon was navigate uh, his, uh, his tool, grasper, how can they relocate it, um, his scissors, and then how well they can find the position to cut in a better way. And um, they receive two actual uh, trial to feel the action. He, he, he personally he did not do any action within these two trials. He only watching and feel. For self-learning, they can watching other people's doing the trial for twice, but without getting the feeling how well the surgeon was navigated and change, uh, reconfigurate uh, his hand motion. The only difference between these two groups is one group received actual kinesthetic feedback from the expert. And then we see the outcome at the end. Okay. And unfortunately, <laughs> such a pattern receives other people's guidance through kinesthetic guidance cannot uh, speed up the learning process equally well. <laughs> uh, there are some benefit, but not significant. And uh, this is recent paper published. So uh, uh, we feel a little unsatisfied and we don't know why and until we meet uh, uh, Dr. Hami uh, uh, Taharik. And he was an expert for uh, haptic feedback training the model, uh, human model skill. He visited our lab um, uh, probably one years ago, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Tawakoli was actually uh, leading a. Uh, 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 this daughter into our lab, and then he mentioned one thing. When you have a, a system to connect two people's haptic feedback, uh, integrate this haptic feedback um, throughout the training phases um, is not enough. You need to create a situation, allow people to constantly getting the feedback from the kinesthetic feedback from the other person. And pretty much like in the driving, when you learn driving, um, the uh, the expert's movement can holding uh, putting his hand in the in the, uh, the steering wheel. If he looks looking at your performance, when you have come to a moment of difficulty, uh, the expert's performance can instantly provide feedback to you. And in this setting, um, so it might be better um, to provide those feedback to the moment when the learner was need. Uh, if just like taking a break to feel other people's walking, maybe not good enough. So we are re-developed uh, our system 
uh, we buy four new uh, haptic uh, feedback devices. Now we are installing uh, this system together, trying to create a situation simultaneously allow two people working side by side. And so when the learner uh, come to the moment of performance difficulty and the experts at the haptic feedback, if, uh, the force feedback, haptic feedback can deliver to the learner instantly. And we hope this can enhance the learning skill learning in such a better way. Okay. Okay. Uh, kinesthetic feedback has another um, research question for us. And um, one is um, when you have all these muscle spindles and gauge tenders regulate your force output, uh, there are some situations that can destroy a natural pathway uh, in, in, in the control of your force delivery. And the typical action in our daily life was when you using a drilling tool. When you use the drilling tool, the vibration coming from this drilling tool can uh, interference with the muscle spindles pathway. And so when you move to a neurosurgical setting uh, or orthopedic uh, uh, surgery, when you holding this drilling tool, although I have the mechanism to reduce the vibration to the hands, and still, it's a quite difficult uh, tool uh, um, when you're holding in a, in a resident's hands. And um, one of my uh, uh, resident uh, is the neurosurgery, uh, fourth year neurosurgeon, and he was taking a, a master degree in our lab uh, for surgical education program. And he was particularly interested in looking at um, when a learner, when a novice, first time holding a, dr uh, a driller, um, the uh, and then to do a task in a spinal uh, surgery here. And then uh, how long it take people uh, to get used to the, uh, the drilling, uh, vibration of the drilling. And then um, uh, with that kind of initially, uh, in the initial phases, uh, would, the, would the people have difficulty to control his uh, precise hand motion? And, and we do collecting a whole bunch of data. Um, so uh, definitely an asper, can holding the tool uh, very precisely uh, because they already come to this situation many, many times. And uh, they can precisely control uh, the, uh, the jumping. Uh, I mean, when, when you're first time putting a drain tool into a uh, 3D printing uh, 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 vertebral uh, was actually uh, surrounding the spinal cord. Um, there are a lot of micro uh, jumping um, because the uh, tool tips uh, uh, tool tips was not so well controlled uh, when you we do the with doing the task. So uh, some some interesting data was here, and then we are uh, moving to our second phase, trying to understand how long it takes people to get used to uh, this situation. Um, so uh, we believe such a training uh, can be done in the simulation environment too. Another uh, weird situation they can destroy our. Uh, kinesthetic feedback loop, it is uh, uh, perform a task under a moving uh, moving vehicle, uh, pretty much like ambulance. Uh, when a group of healthcare people sitting in the ambulance, uh, when they need to, when they need to perform a task directly to the patient, say, if you need to do a CPR, when you, if you need to do a CPR on a moving vehicle, can you still do the task? Well, um, it is questionable, okay? And because, uh, because uh, the entire body are shaping and you cannot predict uh, the movement. So all the muscle spindle and gauge tender are working uh, intensively, okay? Trying to keep your body in a stable position. However, and the moving vehicle is designed for transport the patient and such a tiny little space and the people cannot holding, uh, the healthcare provider cannot have a very stable uh, position. And how can we uh, train these people to do a, a task. And this um, is a just reason uh, review paper uh, talking about uh, CPR performance in the, um, in the ambulance. And they, they actually recognized they are a huge challenge to, uh, per, to perform the CPR in a moving vehicle. And then we, we, we try to uh, create a situation in the lab, in our lab and try to uh, put in a, a healthcare people and uh, just like in the rural, rural, rural ball, 
and then try to see um, when when they uh, how long it take these people, okay? And they can get used to uh, this uh, answer, a basic surgical uh, task. And then uh, if we giving a perturbation, uh, uh, take the rollerboard uh, at the moment uh, when we're sending then a signal. So then uh, the body have to uh, swaving again. And then uh, how long it take the people to get used to it? And what's the impact to his hand performance? And how long it take people to, uh, to uh, practice in the simulation environment and get used to uh, those difficult situations? Uh, can we create a more kind of um, mechanical system to reduce the vibration, allow pain in the hand? And this is another uh, huge challenge for us as well. Uh, but we believe a kind of robotic design can help us to reduce the vibration and reduce the unstable kinesthetic feedback loop allow us to precisely perform the task. Okay, I, and I think this is my, uh, uh, this is summary, okay. <laughs> and the two uh, um, you know, uh, there were a whole bunch of, maybe a, a hundred of thousand different kinds of surgical, and this is very uh, necessary. When I was trained in resident, and resident, and the uh, senior surgeon keep telling me, uh, don't use your hand, okay? <laughs> use your tool to perform a task. If you using your hand to do the surgery, it looks like uh, you're not professional. And the tool design need to uh, fit to the hand of the surgeon. This is kind of my research area. So we like to uh, investigate impact of all different kinds of tool and the tool property and the uh, uh, all different kind of tool property, what's the impact to the eye hand coordination in the uh, skill set, in the human skill set. Um, when we build collaboration between hand and tool, multiple channel of sensory feedback loop are working together uh, to giving surgeon ability to control the tool. And this is our slogan. Uh, this is one of the slogan in our lab. It is, we often say, uh, you can, only do the surgery on the patient uh, until the tool become a natural extension of your hand. So if the tool is a new kind of, um, you are not confident, uh, you are not well control the tool and you can please um, practice in the simulation lab for a longer time uh, before you can actually apply the tool into uh, the true patient in the operating room. Uh, we certainly need more research uh, to determine what's the best training protocol to allow people to learn model skill through the haptic feedback. And one simple basic principle is, the more difficult the tool looks like, much longer time the operator need to get used to working with the tool before they can work in, uh, on the patient side. And uh, surgical simulation lab uh, was built directly in the Faculty of Medicine. And um, our neighbor, uh, one neighbor is Department of Surgery. Uh, and another, another neighbor, it is engineer and computing science. <laughs> so we do a lot of collaboration uh, with surgeon. At the same time, we do uh, building a strong collaboration with um, Marty, uh, Dr. Tawakori, uh, uh, Ruhani, <laughs> uh, 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 several people engineer uh, for robotic design. We're certainly like to bridging technology into the healthcare. We want to do, make sure the tool meet uh, the surgeon in our simulation environment. 